Hello, today I'm going to talk to you about the revolts that William uh, had to deal with uh, after he became King of England. Not too snazzy a video, I'm trying something at the moment, so uh, see how we get on. Right, first of all, we need to understand why there were revolts in the first place. If you remember, William had to gain the support of nobles from across Europe. He did this by promising them land in England when he succeeds in winning the Battle of Hastings. However, he doesn't actually have any land yet. So his plan is to take the land from the Saxon nobles who had fought and died in the Battle of Hastings. This upsets the Saxon heirs because they're the ones who were meant to inherit that land. And so because of this, we get more fairly powerful people joining these revolts because, damn it, they want their land back. So that's why we have the revolts to begin with. Hmm. William needs to get the Saxon Earls on side. So this is one of the key issues is how does he deal with the Saxon Earls? He, always, he is already working to prove that he is the legitimate King of England by making pledges to keep English laws written in English. And he even keeps the dodgy Stigand as his Archbishop of Canterbury. So to win over the Earls, he allows Morcar, Edwin and Waltioff to keep their titles and their lands, even after the Aethling is given land. However, to keep them out of trouble, he takes them effectively as hostages to Normandy with him in 1067 to ensure that there are no rebellions whilst he's gone. So let's talk about the first big rebellion that we are faced with. It's um, led by Edric the Wild. So Wales, as you can see in this picture, that's where it is, has always been troublesome for the Saxons. It was where Goldwinson honed his skills as a fighter. However, it was here in 1067 that an English thane called Edric the Wild, started causing problems for the Normans. With the support of the Welsh princes and English supporters, he launched attacks on the borders, sorry, the border between England and Wales. This began in 1067 until it was eventually defeated, these uprisings, um, in 1069. And in 1069, Edric the Wild submits to uh, William and says, look, I'm sorry, uh, and William forgives him. So that was the first rebellion. The second rebellion, the second big one, is in the southwest. Now, Exeter was a rebellious city. It had refused to swear loyalty to William due to its support for the Goblinsons. It was lo uh, Exeter's located in their oldham, and the high taxes that were being charged by the Normans. Harold's mother uh, was living in the southwest, plotted against William, and invited her surviving family members to join her. William was concerned enough to deal with this per per problem personally. So what he does is he goes down to Exeter and he besieges it for 18 days until it eventually surrenders. Afterwards, he decides, well, people of Exeter, I appreciate taxes have been high. I'm going to lower them for you. But he also builds a castle there to make sure they don't rise up again in the future. He also asks his brother-in-law, Robert of Montaigne, um, to take control of the city and to kind of, yeah, be responsible for their security. Um, there's other uprisings in the southwest after this in, 10, um, in 1068, but it's telling that the last one in 1069, Exeter does, doesn't join it. It doesn't support the uprising, which suggests that actually William's solution in the long term has been successful. Hmm. The next one we're going to look at, oh, it's the biggie. It's the, um, yeah, the controlling the north. William knew that controlling the north would be tough. The Saxons have pretty much left them to rule themselves. It's a hard area to govern because it's a hard area to get to. There's not much in the way of roads. Also, the locals had their own customs and liked to be left alone. William decided that to deal with them, he needed to send a message. And to send a message, he's going to send a Norman. And he chooses Robert Cumin, or Robert Cumin to us English folk. So, what does Robert Cumin do? He goes up and he goes hard. He and his 900 men marched to Durham, burning, looting and killing as they did so. This did not go down with, well with the Northerners. So furious was the rebellion that Edgar the Aethling, who had been given land by William, remember, even joined the revolt. The Northerners attacked Cumin's men and then found the house where Robert Cumin was staying. They burnt it down, killing all inside. Worse for William, they were joined by 240 Danish ships that King Swain had sent to support the cause. Even Waltioff joins as well. Yikes. So what's the response? 
Well, William pays off the Danes to get them to leave, and then he leads an army to the north to deal with the Saxons personally. And they were brutal. He, is employed, he, well, he employed a scorched earth policy of burning down houses, killing livestock, and even salting the earth to make sure that nothing grows there in the future. Orderic Vitalis suggests that this killed about 100,000 people. Modern historians like Mark Morris tend to agree, using the Doomsday Book as evidence. Uh, Saxons were not necessarily killed by the sword, but the intense famine that followed uh, meant that there was a lack of food, we get a refugee crisis, and lots of people starved to death. In fact, in the Doomsday Book, a lot of the North is just classed as waste, given the amount of destruction, which is even more tragic given that before uh, 1066, a lot of this land had been very um, profitable. <sighs> All right, our next big uprising is in East Anglia, and it involves a figure called Harewood the Wake. Upon discovering that his family had been killed by the Normans, Harewood organised a rebellion that drew the attention of disinherited Saxons and the Danes who were actually still yet to leave England, despite the payoff. When news got out that a Norman uh, bishop was about to take control of a monastery in Peterborough, the rebellion marched there and took the gold to prevent it from falling into Norman hands. So there was gold in the monastery, this rebellion. Takes it, oh, we're not going to let the, the Normans have that, and they take the gold for themselves. They then take that gold and set up base at Ely. Ooh, what happens next? So William looks at the situation and goes, how on earth am I going to solve this one? Well, I need to get rid of the Danes. And so he does it again. He pays them off. And this time, after doing a bit more raiding on the coast, they finally leave. However, he's going to be much harsher on the Saxons. Ely was essentially an island in the middle of a dense marsh. Very hard to get to. Once the Normans eventually found a way across the marshes, again, um, sources at the time suggest it might have been monks that told them about a secret way to get there. Uh, the Norman troops were then brutal to the Saxons uh, that they found um, in Ely. Um, many of the Saxons had their eyes gouged out and their hands chopped off as a punishment. However, nobles tend to be treated more um, politely. Um, Smorkar was imprisoned and he would stay in prison for the rest of his life. And Harewood the Wake was actually pardoned. So if you're a rank and file, file soldier, you got a brutal punishment. However, nobles tend to be treated a lot more fairly and a lot more pleasantly um, than the normal soldiers. Hmm. Right, the last one we have to worry about is a Norman rebellion. Um, the rebellion is actually in 1075, but we'll come back to that in a second. One of William's greatest allies was William Fitz Osborne. William trusted him so much that he was given the role of a marcher lord and sometimes acted as a regent when William went out to the country. However, when he died, not all of his land was passed to his son, Roger, Earl of Hereford. Needless to say, Roger was not best impressed with the state of his affairs. He felt far less loyal to William as he did not fight with him at Hastings. This is like a new generation of Normans. They didn't have the same level of loyalty that their parents did to King William. Hmm. So what happens? Roger and his friend, Ralph the Gale, who's from Brittany, and even Waltioff, because why not, plotted against William. This was dangerous for William, as the rebellions could therefore involve Normans. Well, uh, Roger was a Norman. Uh, it could involve Bretons, because Ralph is a Breton. Uh, it could involve Saxons, uh, because of Waltioff. And heck, the Danes will probably get involved too. And sure enough, they do send 200 ships uh, to help support the rebellion. However, William was tipped off before the rebellion began and his troops were able to capture both Roger and Ralph. Waltioff, perhaps unwisely, chose Normandy to be his escape route. William was harsh. He confiscated all of Roger's and Ralph's lands and executed Waltioff. Now, Waltioff is the only Saxon earl to be executed under William, so he must have been a real pain in the um, backside for William. Okay, that's it. That, that is, in a nutshell, the rebellions that William has to deal with.